Krishna. So hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for colleagues from from Osmark for, for organizing such an event. And thank you so much for companies joining the event because we really would love to know more about a global market, especially in, into the Silicon Valley market. And hopefully this event will, will be the first <laughs> in our line of events. And today our companies can ask their questions. Um, after the, um, basically the speech, uh, I mean, uh, the meeting, uh, our, our companies like direct questions. So feel free to just start like writing them down on, an, on, a, on a, like a right side, and then we can add, address them after further will, will be done. Uh, thank you everyone. And I think we, we can just proceed <laughs> to our meeting. Thank you. I would like to welcome okay, Anatoly Motkin, yes, President of Strategies. Anatoly, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for this opportunity to KSSDA. And uh, my name is Anatoly Motkin. I'm a President of Strategies uh, Center for a New Economy, uh, which is a non-profit uh, non developing the IT industry in the post-Soviet countries of uh, Eurasia. Uh, we believe that in Kyrgyzstan, the IT should be or become one of the uh, pillars uh, of economic development along with the tourism and mining. And we believe that uh, it's a unique industry which is able to uh, provide the local uh, youngsters an opportunity uh, to, uh, to, earth, uh, to, to, to earn a highly paid job and also to develop their business in uh, this industry by attracting uh, foreign investments. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, you already have quite developed IT industry and a strong foundation with the IT park and KSSDA. And uh, uh, I think that now at the stage when uh, you should find uh, a way to attract uh, foreign direct investments. And uh, so I'm happy to introduce our friends and colleagues from California, US Mac, uh, with the unique uh, experience um, and background in uh, training the local uh, startups how to attract uh, foreign investment, and uh, also by introducing them to uh, potential investors in Silicon Valley, but also uh, teaching them what actually, how they could be in or become integrated into global IT industry. So I'm uh, delighted to pass the floor to Alfreda Coppola from US Mac from California. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anatoly. Uh, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, be delivering my first talk to your region, Kyrgyzstan, and I hope the conditions uh, for travel will open up soon so that we can get back on the, our frequent monthly travel visits around the world, and especially to visit your country. I've heard many great things, and uh, we are delighted to have this partnership with Strategist. Thank you, Anatoly and Anna, for coordinating this event today. It's uh, 9 p.m. In, in San Francisco, and um, the sun is just going down, but it was a lovely day. I went to one of my favorite vineyards today and enjoyed many of the fine wines um, in California. But uh, as, we, as we know, uh, we're always working. So I'm delighted to be involved uh, this evening on this topic of marketing and selling in Silicon Valley. I hope there are some startups in the audience today. Um, what, we're, what I'm going to talk about is, is a condensed version of a workshop that we do in our typical accelerator programs that usually takes about uh, six hours for this, these topics to be covered. So I'm gonna give you a, a general overview. So uh, if everybody can um, see my screen, I'm just gonna share um, my presentation and hopefully everybody can see that. All right. Great, so a little bit of background. Oh yeah, first I always like to sh start my presentations by showing you examples of some of our happy startups that have participated in our programs in the past. Um, you know, we work with uh, more than in four, 37 different countries around the world. And um, we're, we're looking forward to days where we can be without a mask and we can be all together like these, these pictures. Anyway, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've had uh, three startups in my career in digital media. I'm, I'm still a Canadian citizen, actually. So I, I've had the uh, experience of starting my companies in Canada and uh, exporting to the US, specifically Silicon Valley. Um, 
My, I'm also a founding board member of a new angel investor group in Marin County, which is just north of Golden Gate Bridge in uh, the San Francisco area called Marin Seed Ventures. And we are forming uh, an investor group uh, that we share one thing in common that we're interested in investing in, in foreign uh, companies, companies that are outside of Silicon Valley. Um, I've had one successful exit from my startups in, in the gaming industry. And um, ever since I've, I've you know, launched uh, US Mac about 11 years ago with my co-founders, um, we've had the pleasure of building partnerships with more than 200 venture capitalists and corporate venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. So delighted to, uh, to be welcoming you here uh, today. In addition to, uh, to myself, I have my co-founder, Chris Burry. He's also a serial entrepreneur. He's had nine startups three exits. His last one was very spectacular, 1.6 billion US. He's also an industry fellow at UC Berkeley, where we share a very important partnership. We also have Kate Bonina, who's uh, living right now in uh, Georgia, in, in Belize. Um, so we've had uh, very good relationships building in the region and throughout Central Asia. And uh, as I mentioned, our strong partnership with UC Berkeley, it's Ken Singer, who runs the Center for Entrepreneurship, and he's a big contributor to an advisor to our organization. A little bit of our track record to give you some background in the last 11 years. Okay, so we're, our, we're the largest uh, startup accelerator in Silicon Valley and focused exclusively on helping international companies with what we call global market expansion through Silicon Valley. We've delivered uh, 179 programs up to January of this year, 37 countries. Um, just over 1,500 startups have participated in our programs. We usually do one program per month. And over the years, um, 232 companies have raised 1.5, a total of 1.51 billion, and 19 companies have had an exit valued at 1.1 billion. And for those government officials in the audience, uh, we're always proud to share our, our estimated jobs that we've created in uh, 25 countries, approximately 230,000. So we hope that we can engage with uh, the talent in your region at some point and participate in some of our programs. So our programs are divided by stage of growth. Uh, from early stage at university level, we call them uh, entrepreneurship and innovation programs. Then for companies that are just beginning to form a company, um, sorry, for startups that are early, early stage, we have a global launchpad program. For co companies that are in the growth stage, we have a global growth program. For companies that are doing at least 2 million in revenue, we have a youth future unicorn program. And then we also do some ecosystem building uh, where we help uh, angel investor communities to learn from best practices of Silicon Valley. And then not so long ago, we launched a Prospera Women program, which we are currently running with uh, 12 women-led startups from different parts of the world. And thanks to our partnership with uh, Strategist and with other uh, donor agencies like USAID and CLDP, we started to expand our presence in Central Asia and the Caucasus region. Um, the areas uh, well, in, in Georgia, in Turkey, actually, we're doing a lot of active programs. We're just starting in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. We're happy to explore how we can do uh, more partnership building in Kyrgyzstan. So let's start the presentation, uh, marketing and selling in Silicon Valley, divided up into a few different topic areas. I'm going to talk about, first of all, why Silicon Valley is important, um, not just as a destination, but as a strategic, um, really a strategic partnership um, element in any startup's growth. We're going to be talking about uh, some best practices on, on how to begin marketing in Silicon Valley, and then finally, how to begin selling in Silicon Valley. What are the first critical steps? So let's talk about why Silicon Valley is important. Um, many people are wondering, you know, especially during the pandemic, is, is it really, um, you know, losing its luster? You know, what is the real value of Silicon Valley? We hear stories about people moving away 
Um, you know, what's really fascinating that at the beginning of the pandemic back, you know, last April, we were concerned we would start to lose a lot of activity, lose a lot of, uh, of our programs. And in fact, the opposite occurred. We were doing um, uh, one to two programs per month. So we actually increased our frequency by uh, 80% last year. Um, and it proved that Silicon Valley is actually more than a destination, it's actually a network. And more than ever, it's become a global gateway. So I'm gonna explore that topic a little bit further. Um, another reason why Silicon Valley is important is that it's got a very unique business culture to anywhere else in the United States and anywhere else in the world, we'll talk about that. And it's actually, you know, it is the epicenter, the global ep epicenter for investor resources and advisory talent. So those are the three areas we're gonna talk about in why the Silicon Valley is important. So um, some people may not know, but you know, some people think New York is the most international city in the United States. It's actually the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, more than 60% of all the CEOs in Silicon Valley are, are not American actually. Uh, where you do compare that to any other city in the United States where that number is less than 20%. So even though uh, you know, places like New York and Miami and Chicago are multicultural, uh, when we're talking about startups, investors, and big corporations that have set up in Silicon Valley or, or in their cities, 60%, at least 60% of them are not American born. So it is very much a multicultural um, a place, a destination where every culture is, is welcome. We also have more international investors than anywhere else in the world. A lot of people think that New York is kind of the, you know, you think about Wall Street, you think of a lot of Hollywood films always position New York as a financial center. It absolutely is a financial center, but when it comes to tech startups, um, most of the money flows through Silicon Valley and we have more international VCs that have a presence here. So it really makes it a global, uh, innovation uh, capital um, and thus supports the notion of a, being a global gateway. And then finally, there are more early adopter customers in Silicon Valley than any other any other place in the world. Um, well, what do I mean by that? Is that if you look at some big cities in America like New York, Chicago, Boston, you know Washington, and um, you know Miami, Atlanta, they have international offices of big multinational corporations, but they're really just branch offices. But Silicon Valley's corporates, uh, multinational corporates, they're, they're innovation outposts, okay? So the people who are operating those offices have one job and that one job is to evaluate startup innovation, right? So it actually, it's easier for a startup in Kyrgyzstan to do business in Japan through Silicon Valley. It's easier for a startup in Kyrgyzstan to do business in Germany through Silicon Valley. It's really quite remarkable. If we just take a look at, at for an example of the telecom sector, okay, we have Singapore, United Kingdom, we have France, China, Spain, Switzerland, United States, obviously, Japan, Korea, and Germany all have innovation outposts in Silicon Valley. These innovation offices don't exist in other cities of the world. So if, I, if I'm from Kyrgyzstan or if I'm from any other country in the world and I wanna do business in France, it's likely, higher likely that I can do business with France at, with Orange, Orange Silicon Valley in their San Francisco office because their office is set up to evaluate innovation, right? So it's really remarkable. In fact, I would say about 60% of our success stories come from uh, foreign companies that are doing business on an international scale through Silicon Valley. If I look at the numbers of how many of our startups, startup graduates have, have been successful to get customers, it's been more than 48%, 48% of 1,500 startups and only 98 have set up an office in the United States. Okay, so that means that the other 400 or so, the other, it's actually the other 600 or so are doing business internationally 
but through Silicon Valley without having to set up an office. So this is what makes Silicon Valley a global gateway. And this is just the telecom sector. If we look at every other sector, automotive, financial, consumer brands, enterprise, uh, electronics, and retail, um, you know, I, I, I would occupy about eight more slides of logos with all of the international outposts. It's really quite remarkable. So these are the success stories that we see. Um, it's often that a, a, an international startup will do business on a global scale before they actually do business with uh, uh, American companies, but they do it through the Silicon Valley channel. Secondly, we have a unique business culture here. It's really quite remarkable. You know, I'm born and raised in Canada. Um, I thought that the Canadian culture for business was going to be very similar to United States and similar to Silicon Valley. I started doing business in Boston and New York because it was very close to my uh, Eastern Canada offices. But when I went to Silicon Valley, I noticed that it's really, really unique and different culture. The only thing that was similar is that we shared the same language. Okay, but what is unique is the decisions are made incredibly quickly. Um, and this is a, it's a good thing and it can be a challenging thing for many of our startups um, because they're not ready for the fast decision-making that's happening. You know, when I was in Canada and many of the people from other countries we work with, they have the similar answers to this question and say, well, you know, what is the biggest challenge you face when you're trying to do business in a place like Silicon Valley? The decisions are made so quickly. You know, when I was in Canada, it would sometimes take 25 meetings to get a contract signed, right? 25 meetings, six to 12 months. And that's a long time, but that's the way it was done. In Silicon Valley, it can be less than three months and less than five meetings to make a decision, right? So what makes it challenging is that those difficult questions that the, um, you know, the buyers are asking, you've got to be ready to answer those questions. So a lot of the graduates in our program, we, we give a lot of coaching to help them navigate those tough decision-making process and negotiation skills are really important. So it's a good thing though, because it means you're not wasting a lot of time. Um, they, they, you know, time is, 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 is everybody's currency here in Silicon Valley. There's not a lot of time. Another really, really exciting thing is it's really easy to meet people. You know, when I was in Canada, I would go to a lot of networking events and I would often stick around with my same group of people that I knew. And I was often shy to meet new people. Um, I'm not shy anymore, I'll tell you that, but um, I was shy and many startups, especially engineering driven startups. So building social skills is really challenging. So it's hard to meet new people. But in Silicon Valley, meeting people and networking is part of the unique culture here. It's, it's uh, people are open to meet new people because they never know when they're going to meet that new customer, that new introduction to an investor or a potential partner, right? So they're always looking to meet people and people are really, really welcoming here. And as I mentioned earlier, it's an international culture here. So often we'll get people from other parts of Asia or parts of Europe where people's names are difficult to pronounce or sometimes they have an accent when they talk. It's really not an issue here. People are incredibly patient and welcoming simply because we have such a, a large base of, of non-American uh, born uh, CEOs. So it's, it's really quite unique compared to other parts of, of the United States. Um, and then finally, what makes Silicon Valley important and unique is that it's, it's really the funding and talent epicenter, right? As I mentioned earlier, a lot of people think that um, you know, so much of the investment capital is, is, you know, comes from New York or, or other parts of the East Coast of the United States, but more than 50% of investments flow through the offices of Silicon Valley, especially early stage investments. Um, there is more early stage capital, we call that risk capital, in Silicon Valley than anywhere else in the world. Um, it's, you know, we're talking billions and billions of of what we call um, seed and early stage capital. That's where you get your first amount of money to, to test and validate your product in this competitive environment. And then there's a lot more later stage and growth capital here than anywhere else in the United States. So it's really important. 
And it's not just the investors that are important to build relationships with. It's also all of the players that support startups. So these are the corporate executives. These are lawyers and accountants. Lawyers and accountants can actually be important allies as you're building your business. They can give you important access to investors, but it's also advisors, serial entrepreneurs and mentors. Um, some studies were done by the Startup Genome Project about seven years ago through uh, researchers from Berkeley and Stanford. And there was a direct, you know, kind of no surprise conclusion that the startups that had mentors from Silicon Valley raised um, three times more money than those that did not have mentors from still Silicon Valley. And it also showed that um, the number of startups that raised capital all had mentors. And those who didn't have me mentors, um, their, their ability to raise capital was significantly lower. <clears throat> so for, for instance, our, in our organization, US Market Access Center, we have more than 220 mentors in our network, in our community. And, you know, when I was in Canada, it was really difficult to find uh, mentors, excuse me, <clears throat> simply because we did not have um, a, an extensive, you know, case studies of serial entrepreneurs that have become successful. But here, I would say 80% of our mentors are serial entrepreneurs that have lived that journey from zero to 2 million, from 2 million to 20 million, to 20 million to 50 million, and above. So when you live that journey, you, you can learn from those experiences. And, and that's why it's important to have advisors that can take you through those, those stages of growth. It is a very different kind of um, advice that you need when you're going from zero to 2 million, or you're going to, from 2 million to beyond, right? And all the resources are here and available in Silicon Valley in abundance. So on the topic of, of funding, there's a great, um, and I'll share this presentation with uh, the organizers afterwards. There's a great report um, from CB Insights PWC, Money Tree Report, it's called, it's a free download. And for those of you who want to learn more about how investments flow in Silicon Valley, it's, it's issued every three months. And it's a, it's a wonderful 35 page report. On the very last page, it always talks about what's hot and what's coming up. And this is a great opportunity for startups to monitor on a regular basis um, what it is that Silicon Valley investors are looking for and the comparisons of what other kinds of investments are being made around the world. So that sums up um, the overview about Silicon Valley. Now we're gonna switch over to the, the first uh, section about marketing, marketing in Silicon Valley. So, you know, this is a, um, it's a big topic. Obviously people go to business school to learn about best practices in marketing. Um, we have several, uh, several hours of, of workshops on the topic. So we're just gonna give you a quick overview, but in short, it's all about selling value, okay? Um, unlike other parts of the world, like I'd say, I know in Europe and Latin America and Asia, People spend a lot of money on public relations, on media attention, media coverage. So these things are important. Media coverage is important when you're growing, right? When you're growing and scaling fast. But when you're just getting started, the type of marketing and PR is just not important enough to attract the attention of buyers in, in Silicon Valley in the United States. So it's really what, what customers and partners and investors are looking for is how well a startup can communicate the value that you bring, okay? And, and we're not talking about uh, valuation of your company, we're talking about business value, okay? Because if I'm a potential customer, I only care about a few things. I care about saving money, making money, reducing waste, increasing efficiency, right? Those are the things, those are what we call the benefits, right? So, it's, it's, you know, there are three things. <laughs> we care about value, we care about value, and we care about value. So there is a great exercise that we teach that is relatively easy to do. And I encourage any startups in the audience to do this. Not, we're not gonna do it live. We don't have time to do it live, but you can do this on your own. 
And the reason why you would do this is it's going to help you to develop your messaging across all the media channels, okay? So you do this exercise, and the results of the exercise will help you to write really good brochures, really good websites, really good social media messaging, and, and it should be spread you know, throughout your entire company, right? It's all about value. Now, the, the exercise is called NABC, and it's about your value proposition. This was developed by the Stanford Research Institute that's now public domain. Um, N stands for need, A stands for approach, B stands for benefit, and C stands for competition. And we're gonna walk through each one of these um, important elements, okay? So once you develop the text around these four elements, you have the foundation to build all of your marketing messages in the context of selling value, okay? So N stands for need, and it's, it's really, it's what is the need of the customer, but what is the problem in the market that you are going to solve, okay? So obviously you are solving a problem with your company. Your company has a value proposition, and what is the problem? So here's some examples, okay? For example, online shops, are struggling to increase conversion rates during off-peak periods, okay? So as you know, during seasonal periods, it's, you know, most online shops have no problem selling. Um, maybe your company has a solution on how you can help increase sales during off-peak periods. That's an example of a business problem that you could be solving. Here's another one. Hospitals are losing a billion dollars per year because of administrative inefficiencies, okay? So that's an, another example of a problem, okay? So you, as a startup, should identify what is your customer's problem? What is their need that needs, you know, what, what is the problem that needs to be solved? So it's important for you to identify who that customer is in your statement, okay? Online shops may be too general. Maybe I should be saying something like, you know, large or medium to large online shops or small merchant online shops, right? So you could want to be as specific as possible. Um, when I say hospitals, it could be hospitals in small villages or, or small towns or hospitals in big cities, right? What is the difference? Where is the focus of my customer? So that's, that's the need part. And then we go to approach. And this is where you talk as a startup, this is where you talk about your solution, okay? What is the unique approach that you're offering customers to help solve their problem? So here's an example using the two previous examples. Our marketing analytics platform offers discounts during off-peak periods, okay? That's the unique thing that my product or service delivers to the customer. Or in the case of the hospital, our biomedical enterprise resource planning software uses artificial intelligence to predict administrative waste, okay? So that's our unique approach to solving the problem. Now, as we move forward, the B, B is the most important part because what do customers care about? Remember what I said, what I said earlier, they, they care about saving money, reducing waste, increasing efficiency, all of those types of things. Those are benefits words. But what Americans really care about is quantifying that business benefit, okay? It's, it's easy for me to say, oh, my solution helps you to save money. That's kind of not very helpful because I don't know if you're gonna help me save $1 or save a million dollars, right? So it's really important to quantify. So here's an example using the e online shop in the hospital. Increase sales by up to 35% during off-peak periods or increase in efficiency by up to 60% per year, right? That's what businesses really care about. That's what investors care about. They want to know that the solution you're bringing to the table is something that's going to bring dramatic impact. Now, a lot of young startups are saying, well, I don't know what that number is. I don't know if it's 35% or 40%. So we're not asking for the exact number. 
but we want to know a general range. And that's why it, it helps to say things like by up to 35%, by up to 60%. You as a professional or expert in your, in your, in your uh, field should know and should be able to give an educated guess that you can defend, okay? We know you're a startup. We know you don't have these exact numbers yet, but it's important for you to at least uh, present um, a case of what is your value proposition in this case. And then finally, we have the competition. Ultimately, we want to know why are you better than the other people that are solving the same problem, right? So you can say things like this. Unlike typical solutions, our platform leverages crowdsourced data, which allows us to create unique offers to our customers, something like that. Or unlike um, this, this company or this other company, our sophisticated artificial intelligence predicts wastefulness faster, right? Something like that. So it's important for you to acknowledge who your competitors are because it helps you, helps your customer understand that you understand how you're different from the competition. So that is the NABC. And as I mentioned earlier, if you can develop compelling text for each one of these elements, N, A, B, and C, you have the foundation to build all your strong marketing messages in the context of selling value. A lot of people spend a lot of time on approach because they're talking about their product. It's really, people don't really need to know about the technology. They don't need to know about the code. They don't need to talk, know about your PhDs that you have as, as founders. What they really care the most about is the benefits, right? Okay, so that I hope this can help you using the NABC approach. All right, so that's about marketing. Again, I condensed several hours of marketing workshops into, um, into just a few minutes. But the NABC is a very, very uh, successfully proven method to develop that value statement. So now we'll move over to selling. And there are some critical first steps. I can tell you that about 40% of the startups that go through our programs have made a critical mistake. They, they start they, they decide internally, okay, we want, we want to now expand to the United States. So the first thing they do is they start, uh, you know, they go to a conference and they meet some Americans and they say, hey, this person really seems to know the industry that we're in. Why don't we hire this person, right? So they sign a, a one-year contract. They're probably paying them anywhere from, you know, $10,000 to $12,000 per month, and they're going to hope for the best. And it's, it's honestly, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here, about 40% of the startups we work with have gone through this wasteful step. Um, the reason why it's wasteful is because first of all, you don't know these people very well. Um, and it's really difficult for you to put all your faith in one person to take care of sales and marketing of one of the most competitive regions in the world. You as a founder, you as a CEO need to experience that sales process yourself. And that's why it's important for startups to go through a formal acceleration program in Silicon Valley to experience this journey themselves. Um, if you don't have the ability to participate in an accelerator program, then we encourage you to at least come through to a couple of American conferences and do your first sales yourself. It takes a little bit longer, but you will learn more. Thus, you will learn the type of individual that you should be hiring if you do need to take that step and hire somebody, okay? But please don't make that, that mistake in your first experience of trying to sell in the United States. So here are some first steps. First of all, you need to position yourself like a US company, okay? Silicon Valley, especially all the big cities in America, especially Silicon Valley, um, have thousands of new visitors every single week. And most of these people are either attending a conference, they'll share a business card that has, you know, the, your, your local address, your local phone number, um, and sometimes a name that's difficult to understand. And an American 
you may have a nice, friendly conversation with an American partner, or American customer, American investor, but they're going to look at that business card and they're going to say, oh, this person is not from here. So, you know, they're going to go to the bottom of the pile, right? Because simply because it's like a revolving door of newcomers every single week. And Americans like to do business with Americans. That's just simply the way it is. It's not necessarily always the case, but when you're starting to build a relationship with somebody new, you want to remove as many barriers as you can. So how do you do that? Uh, well, we're going to talk about how to do that in a few minutes. Secondly, we, we want to build a network of trusted partners. So we're going to talk about how to do that. And then finally, you actually physically have to come to Silicon Valley. Um, there are uh, opportunities to do this via Zoom, but it's a lot easier in person. And since now we can start to, to see the signs of recovery, we're going to focus on, you know, on that happening. We're starting to see people are booking trips for the months of October, November, and certainly for the following year, it's going to be, it should be almost business as usual. So first steps, position yourself like a U.S. company. The very first thing you should do is get a virtual office. This is a relatively inexpensive way to position yourself like a, com a U.S. company. Many of the co-working spaces in Silicon Valley offer this as a service. It's quite inexpensive. It's about $100 per month. Certainly a lot cheaper than having a real office. You don't need a real office at this point because all you're doing in your first months is building relationships. But you can put that address on your business card. You can put that address on your website. You can put it on your marketing material. And this is critical because when during any decision-making process, when you meet with a prospective customer, that person, that individual that you speak with, you probably made a good impression. But then that person is going to share your materials with their colleagues. And the first thing they're going to do is go to your website. They want to see that you have some kind of established presence in the United States. Again, this is not 100% necessary in all cases, but what you're doing is removing barriers. Number two, get yourself a .com domain, right? I know that it's difficult sometimes because many of the good names are already taken, but you can, you can make modifications to your main brand uh, like go to brand or um, brandusa.com. It's important to have a .com because again, you're removing a barrier. It shows that you're committed to doing business in the United States. Another important part is to adapt all of your marketing materials to United States English, not UK English. I know it sounds like a subtlety, but uh, Americans can notice the difference between the spelling of UK English and American English. So take that extra step and adapt it to American English. And then finally, and this is one of the most important parts, you may have some success stories in your home country, but it's important to adapt those press materials to attract a US audience. I'll give you an example. When I was in Canada, one of my biggest customers was Bell Canada. They're the biggest telecommunications giant in, in Canada. But most Americans didn't know that. They didn't know who Bell Canada was. They had no idea. So they saw on my website that I had announced the big partnership with Bell Canada. And that contract was worth more than $400,000. But again, Americans didn't even read the headline because they had no idea who Bell Canada was. So I noticed that Bell Canada was a partner with Ameritech, which was part of AT&T. And AT&T is the biggest telco in the US. So I put in my headline for the U.S. website, AT&T partner Bell Canada strikes partnership with my company, right? So these are subtle things, but they make a big difference because what you don't want is someone to have absolutely no context when you have a big success story in your home country and they don't know who they are, right? Suddenly your, your value is diminished or it goes unnoticed, right? These are just some, some tips on positioning yourself like a U.S. company. Secondly, we want you to build a network of trusted partners. Now, this is, it's, it's harder to, it's easier to, easier to say than to do, but there are some great tools out there um, that help you to build a network 
of not just potential customers and investors, but you want to build that network in Silicon Valley with other entrepreneurs, okay? Other entrepreneurs who could be potential partners who are scaling at the same pace as yours could be your allies. You can also build relationships with big established players, right? They often have partner programs that you can subscribe to. I mentioned earlier about the importance of lawyers, accountants, and bankers. These are all important people that are on your business development team. I can remember uh, one of the companies I was helping from Europe, they had an e-commerce product search solution and they were doing quite well in Europe, but they had no American customers and they were ready to raise money. They had set up an office in Silicon Valley, but they had absolutely no, um, no channel whatsoever to get to American investors. So I, I identified two lawyers, law firms, that had similar portfolios of e-commerce companies. And um, well, actually, I contacted many lawyers, but I, I narrowed down to two. And from these two lawyers, I was able to get 17 meetings with investors for this company. And I didn't have to pay them any money. Now, eventually, out of the 17, two of them were very interested and you know, the startup we were working with eventually got funded. Um, but it's a numbers game. But the, the point is that would have been really difficult without the support of these lawyers um, who are operating in the same space. So I remember when I was in Canada, I thought, you know, my time was my experiences with lawyers and accountants were always expensive and boring, right? Really, really boring. So it's very different. In Silicon Valley, the, these network of professional services people like lawyers, accountants, and bankers they want to see you succeed. So they're willing to do many things to help you succeed if they believe in your company, like making introductions to investors. We also want you to build a network of trusted partners, including thought leaders and other industry experts who could be your mentors. And all of these people are important. The more of these people you know in Silicon Valley, the more likely that you will have what we call referrals, referrals, right? To potential customers and investors. Now, how do we do this? We do this using LinkedIn. And I encourage you, if you're still using the free version of LinkedIn, I encourage you to spend that $80 per month and where you have access to a lot more resources. And there's a lot of, again, this is another one hour workshop on how to do this, but there's a lot of free YouTube videos, LinkedIn videos on how to start making contact with these types of people. I encourage you as startups in the audience, please connect with me on LinkedIn and you'll have at least one more contact in Silicon Valley. And what you'll do is you start searching for people who could be your partners or customers and you look at what degree of contact you would have with them. So by having me as a contact, you will leverage my network. And I have uh, more than 7,000 contacts in LinkedIn about half of them are in Silicon Valley. So you can have some relevant connections. Um, it's a place to start, okay? And we strongly recommend it. It's the easiest and cheapest way to start building your network. All right, thirdly, <clears throat> excuse me, you need to come to Silicon Valley. And the reason why you need to come is because this is a culture of networking, right? There are more than Pre-pandemic, there were more than 25 networking events per day happening in San Francisco and Palo Alto alone. And many of these events are focused at, at startups. Um, whether you are a startup in the agriculture industry or, in, or uh, food or robotics or biomedical, there is something for everybody. And there are more than 200 events you know, actually, sorry, more than about 800 events per month happening. So the reason why there are so many events is because there are so many different types of people that want to meet and gather and refer to, refer, be met and be referred to, right? I today still spend about two hours a week making introductions to startups, right? And people ask, is someone paying you for that? No, no one's paying me for that. Because what happens is other people in my network are making introductions for me. So it's, it's really kind of a pay it forward mentality. I help people and other people help me. And this is part of the culture of networking in Silicon Valley. Um, so it is really important. 
this is a short list of some of the startup uh, networking communities that are out there. So Startup Digest is actually a nationwide service that's uh, funded by Techstars, um, but the Startup Digest in Silicon Valley is quite big. Um, even during pandemic, there's a lot of activity. Pitchforce is a network, a networking organization that has investor pitch events every single week. And they've been maintaining their practice even during pandemic via Zoom. But um, obviously, it's a lot more effective in person. And then both Eventbrite and meetup.com have searchable events in their search engine. So you could type robotics, for example, or gaming, and you can see what events are coming up in those categories using their search. A lot of these events are quite inexpensive, usually less than $50 to attend. And you will find that you can find events that um, are very relevant to your target area. The Silicon Valley Forum is less frequent. It's about um, twice per month, but it has a great set of resources with uh, big corporations and investors in their events. And then you have annual conferences that have still maintained their online version. There's, the list is far too long, but these are some of the biggest ones. Health 2.0 is, is twice per year. The Game Developers Conference is in March. Uh, Dreamforce is in uh, September and Oracle Worlds in October. Um, and usually they increase the, the population of the city of San Francisco by about um, you know, 30 or 40% during these events. So it's important and you can go um, <clears throat> use LinkedIn to find out who the speakers are at these events. If you find uh, like at some of these big conferences, some of the panels, um, the people who are speaking on the panels, you can build uh, uh, through LinkedIn, you can build uh, relationships with these people, especially if you have some interesting information to share. It's all about building that network and you can do that long before you come to Silicon Valley to, to have face-to-face -face meetings. So I know I threw a lot of data at you, a lot of content at you in a short period of time. I wanted to keep my presentation to under 40 minutes so we have time for q and I encourage you all to please connect with me on LinkedIn or any of our, uh, any of our core team members listed in the beginning of the presentation. As I mentioned, I will share this presentation with the organizers and uh, you'll have these resources available to you um, as you need them. It's been a pleasure to present to you and I'm happy to take uh, Q&A um, at your leisure. Sure, thank you so much, Alfredo. It was like super interesting, I think. <laughs> and I was, I was trying to write some notes <laughs> while you were presenting. Um, so, um, our companies, I don't see any raised hands or questions. So your companies, IT companies, uh, feel free to raise your hand and then we will promote you to a speaker or feel free to just drop your questions and I can just read them out. And meantime, while you're thinking on your questions, I wrote a few of them. <laughs> sure, don't be shy. Um, so with all this like COVID situation and everything, do you really think that it is worth uh, like actually taking time and fly to California to attend the event? Because I know that, um, I mean, obviously the pharma changed and uh, the COVID thing, it's kind of like restricting to gather a lot of people. Like, is it better to just stick to online format and just try to join and connect um, with those like companies and people and the events which you shared, or it's actually worth like buying the ticket and then flying to Silicon Valley? So, yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. You know, in general, I don't think anybody should just buy a ticket and go and, and start there. I think they need to start virtually. I think one thing that the COVID situation has taught us is how to leverage the value out of doing online engagements. So, you know, we are running, for example, most accelerator programs are running virtually now anyway, and it's a great way to start building those relationships. It's a great way to start learning the tips and tricks of how to start selling. But, you know, so I, I consider that the homework, your, your preparation work that you need to do before you come. We encourage mm -hmm. people to come for about two weeks, a minimum. Mm -hmm. But 
you don't don't just show up. All of that hard work <laughs> needs to be done in advance. Okay, a lot of research. We live in, a, in a, an environment that's full of res online resources. It's important to take them all, right? Just mm -hmm. about every topic that I covered has a lot of free YouTube videos, a lot of free tutorials, right? I'm not mm -hmm. saying they're the best, but for people who, are, who, who don't have a lot of money in their startup and they're not part of an accelerator program, then mm -hmm. this is often a good way to start. Okay, okay, great. Thank you so much. I see Shirin um, is raising her hand and I see also one more question. And then- uh... Yes, let me just break the ice. Maybe some of the uh, participants are shy. Uh, Alfredo, thank you very much. Despite of late time, uh, you gave us really uh, important information, extracts of really most important information, I think. And uh, I don't have a startup, <laughs> but uh, I have a question. Um, how do you think, is it important to grow uh, first locally and then um, go to Silicon Valley? Or uh, if, um, or you think that uh, you can escape this uh, step and go uh, directly to Silicon Valley if you have a startup? Because uh, the uh, markets are completely different and what works in uh, our region cannot work obviously in cent uh, in the Silicon Valley and uh, in global market and vice versa. So uh, in case of experience or maybe in case of what how do you think what's 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 your uh opinion thank you yeah i think that it's really important to start selling first in your region and learn all of the challenges how to overcome the challenges of selling to customers in your region it's important to have your product or service validated in your home country before you want to go global it's it's just infinitely more difficult to go global when you have not validated your solution in your local market. Um, in the past, we used to, uh, let's say the past, I would say seven, eight years ago, we used to require that companies were selling at least half a million in revenue in their home country before coming to Silicon Valley. Now we want companies to come sooner. And the reason for that is there's two reasons. One is by the time you are doing half a million in revenue in your home country, chances are too much time has passed and your biggest competitors in Silicon Valley are probably much better funded than you. So they're gonna, they have a, a competitive advantage significantly. We want you to come earlier so that you can validate sooner. Um, so in this case, we call Silicon Valley is like a tool. <laughs> you're, you're, using, you're using Silicon Valley as a learning platform as opposed to a, a place to, to get customers. You can have meetings with customers. We call them customer development meetings. And, you know, we always say it's better to ask for advice instead of asking for money. So we call them customer development. Instead of saying, hey, buy my product, you're saying, what would you think about this approach to solving this problem? So you're asking for advice. And it, what happens is the company ends up learning if their solution actually has some strength. and um, and if it does, the chances are they're making a strategic connection. If the, if the advice they're getting is, well, you're not really solving it the way we would like to see it, but here's my feedback. You can take that feedback and adapt your product, adapt your approach, and you're gonna be a lot more successful in being competitive than if you wait until you get half a million in revenue in your home country. I know it's a long answer, but um, that's the way we have shifted um, how we answer that question over the years. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Maidana. Uh, I believe it's a company called Changchun. They teach uh, the Chinese uh, language. And the question is, uh, do you have an accelerator starting soon for startups from our country exactly focusing to US market? So we don't have anything planned in your country, but I am sure that we can work out a way to get that going soon, right, Anatoly? <laughs> so we, we would be delighted to. Now, on the on, we we do have. I can said I can tell you that we are running right now a program um, for Ukrainian startups, and we have uh, startups that are participating from Georgia and other parts of uh, 
of Europe. So we do this twice a year where we invite people from different nations together. And then on our, um, in September, we're launching Prospera Women for women, on, women entrepreneurs. And that's gonna be open to any, um, any woman startup who's at least validated in their home country. So I'm happy to give you that information um, after like tomorrow, I can follow up with more information on these two programs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what about, um, about accelerated programs, in, for example, in Silicon Valley, where our companies can go and attend online, offline? Yeah, so um, happy to discuss that further. So who's asking? Is it a startup that's asking? Uh, yes, I'm just uh, elaborating on the like a previous question. Sure. Yeah, so I can I can send to Anna and um, and to you this mm -hmm. information on our next programs and what the dates are. Yep, yep, that would be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Um, I see one more question here. Um, so the main question is how to meet uh, basically startups in Silicon Valley and uh, where to start beside LinkedIn. Okay, besides LinkedIn. Yes. Okay, if you're not, if you're not, um, if you're not doing it, um, if you're doing it virtually. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the, the other important places to start are to go to um, some of these big conference websites and find out who the other startups are that are exhibiting. And you can find out the startups in your sector Mm -hmm. um, that are exhibiting at these conferences and you can find a way to you can you can find out who they are through there there's also a website called uh, crunchbase and uh, a, it's a great service for finding other startups so if you type uh, you know robotics and silicon valley in the search you'll find out who the robotics startups are in silicon valley right mm -hmm. okay great thank you um, there is another question um, from Aisha. Um, it's known that 90% of startups fall, um, I don't know, fail in the first year. Uh, what's the main reason and how not to make the same mistake? How to not, what was the last part of the question? How not to make the same mistake, like why the startups fail in the first year and how to avoid uh, making those mistakes. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a whole workshop on that one. But in general, uh, the reasons why startup fails, it's 90% it, of the time, it's because they don't, they don't have customers, right? It means that the problem you're solving, the problem's not big enough, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we always use the, the comparison of a shark bite or a mosquito bite, right? So if I have a shark bite, I'm obviously screaming in pain and I need, I need a, an ambulance, I need a doctor, I need a, a surgery room, right? I need a lot of things. If I have a mosquito bite, I don't need very much, right? So if, you're, if, if your startup is solving a mosquito bite problem, you're probably not gonna have many customers because mm -hmm. the mosquito bite is just not a big problem. But if you're solving a shark bite problem, that's a huge problem. And, and chances are people will spend a lot of money to make that shark bite go away, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I see here one raised hand from uh, Sayasat. So Sayasat, I'm, um, I need you to the panelists, so feel free to ask your questions directly. You can just um, unmute your mic and feel free to talk. Say that, you still here? Um, I think say that, oh, yeah. We can hear you say that, feel free to proceed with your question. Um, so I think, 
We are not getting a question. <laughs> Meantime, uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat. One sec, let me check one more time. So Nikita wrote that thanks a lot for the presentation. I think that's going to you. <laughs> um, so one of the questions which I wrote um, for, for myself, like, Technically speaking, we uh, like we did cover that if you want to uh, start marketing in the Silicon Valley, first you need to go and then get like connections online, LinkedIn, or through different like webinars and then events. And then second, definitely you need to get some like in um, in introductions, obviously. And then um, like. I know it, it might come like a little bit weird question, but for example, if uh, we have 17 companies attending today and some of them in FinTech, some of them in health tech, some of them in ed tech, is there a way that um, if we send uh, some of the pitch decks of those companies, you can, I don't know, advise us to, to I don't know, reach out to this or that person about investment or about accelerator programs and, and so on. I know it's like very broad question, but um, like, is it like possible? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would love to use this as a as a way to build a relationship with your uh, your community and your your ecosystem. So yeah, I'm happy to see a list. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I think um, would love to meet some of the important players, whether they're the governments or other accelerators or investment community in your region. Mm -hmm. So we can learn more about your talent pool. Mm -hmm. so consider this a, a formal positive uh, greeting to mm -hmm. start doing business in your region. Great, great, thank you. We just recently had this event with the Sturgeon Capital. Uh, the investment director was visiting uh, our, our country and um, we basically gathered all our companies and they did they like pitch decks and even like broad day pitch decks like, like a printout versions. So in the future, um, is it possible maybe to arrange event when our companies can come in or we can select like 10 to 15 and they can pitch their ideas just to see if they valid enough to, to go further? Or it's better just to stick to the accelerator program and then only after, after, after that proceed with, the, with this type of activity. Yeah, I think it would be a great first way to start um, engaging together. We could do a pitch event together. We could mm -hmm. you know, maybe choose your top six or eight and mm -hmm. then have them pitch to a panel of Silicon Valley investors. We do this all the time. Nice, thank you. That sounds great. Yeah. Let's Let's... Let's follow up on this, okay? We will so, do that. <laughs> yeah. So you are uh, you have your own company called Codify. Ah uh, yes, I'm like part of uh, IT Association Plus. I have my own company, also with the uh, with the global market uh, entrance ambitions. So that's why it's like for me also so very interesting and personal. Great. Well, I just sent a LinkedIn request to you. Oh, wow. Thank you. That was fast. <laughs> yeah. Okay, team, that's how we should connect. Send LinkedIn requests during the event. Don't wait till the end. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, my pleasure. I, oh, I see one more question. Um, how further will, we already have one client from European Union and we are working with it. We would like to extend, expand and find new clients. Shall we look for clients? who can help make the project ideas to come true or shall we propose clients with an MVP? It's coming from Tilek Nurdin. Okay, so your uh, internet connection got a little fuzzy. So it said uh, you have a company, we already have customers in Europe and then it broke down, I couldn't hear. Oh, sorry. Part. And they would like to expand and find new clients. Uh, so the question is, shall we look for clients uh, who are looking for a company who can help make their project ideas to come true or shall we propose clients with an MVP idea? I believe uh, the question more about like, okay, this is an IT company, they do software products and like, should they reach out to companies who wants to build a software product 
or they should build an MVP product and just propose that product to potential clients. Hope I'm elaborating that question correctly. So like, yeah. please correct yeah. me. Yeah, well, it's, it's hard to answer that uh, with a lot of um, detail without knowing the company very well. But in general, it's easier to sell a product than to sell services. There are too many competitors, too many companies selling services. And especially in Silicon Valley, the, the only the only outsourcing, well, the most successful outsourcing companies are those that have a full-time representative here because there's just too much competition from India, China, Ukraine, you know, everywhere. <laughs> okay, got it. Thank you. So to like go with an MVP if you can, if you cannot open up an office or at least one person in <laughs> in, in, in the United States. Uh, there is one more question from Vitali. Um, what is the approximate rate of successful and failed startups in your portfolio? If it is not a secret, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not a secret. So we measure um, a few things. We measure, obviously, how many companies got accepted into our programs, how many got customers, how many uh -huh. raised capital, and how many got acquired. So... Um, we, we did not keep track of how many we've evaluated, but my estimate is we've evaluated more than 5,000 startups. So 1,532 up to January have been accepted. 51% um, have been successful in getting customers, okay? So just over half. And 19% um, have been successful in raising capital. So those are, those are the numbers. And remember that 100% of all the companies are not American or, um, you know, not American, they're from overseas. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. I don't see any more questions here. Let me check one more time. Uh, team, anyone has any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to raise your hand or just type your question. Um, I think, oh, um, Abigail has a question, so I just raised you to the panelist. Avi, feel free to just ask. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, Alfredo, thank you so much. Uh, we've heard a lot of good insights, really useful information that we didn't know before. Um, so the participants who, are, um, who joined us today um, have been selected by our organization, our association, and other accelerators uh, who are operating locally. So my question is um, more technical. I think with strategies, we are now still talking about the format of um, cooperation with your organization. Uh, maybe it's gonna be, yeah, as uh, Gina said, for first um, a couple of meetings and then after that accelerator program. And then for KSSDA members, there will be an um, exclusive opportunity to participate in this. Um, so my question is uh, the level of the knowledge or experience of the companies we have selected may vary. Um, some of the companies they have already um, invest, uh, attracted investment from uh, US funds. Uh, some of them haven't. Some of them have been through these accelerators. Some of them not. And so when you select for the program, let's say one program for the country or the region, how do you solve this problem? Or like, do you accept them on different stages or do you first do like some kind of audit or um, see where the company is at? Thank you. Yeah, great, great questions. So we do have programs for every stage of growth. Um, and so the question goes back to whoever the host is, um, what are the objectives? Um, the most popular programs are those companies that are ready to go global, okay? So that means they're already selling in their home country. We don't put a number, a minimum number on how much the sales should be, that they sh but they should have validation in their home country. And that is sort of the prerequisite for a company that's ready to ex export, ready to go outside of their home country. Um, so that is the, that's the most popular program called Global Growth. For companies that are pre-MVP, Okay, this is companies that maybe are, uh, they, they have a, a, an idea, but they haven't formulated it into an MVP yet. We have a different um, 
program that's called the Global Launchpad. So they're getting Silicon Valley thinking and it helps them to identify business model uh, discovery or business model discovery and market discovery. So those are the two most popular um, types of programs that we run. Okay, thanks, appreciate your work. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much, Alfreda, Natoliana, for, for arranging the event. Um, I don't see any more questions, so I think uh, we can just share uh, the recording of, of today's like meetup and obviously your presentation with our attendees and uh, uh, with, with our companies. Thank you so much again for like really useful uh, information, I think. Um, we, we, we will do our best to start like following uh, your, your tips and, and, and advice. Um, Anatoliana, do you have anything to add, comment? Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for this and uh, thank you, Alfreda, as usual. And uh, I think that we should uh, uh, pass to some might be practical uh, side and to think uh, what are the opportunities for local startups in Kyrgyzstan working together with US Mac, and uh, I'm uh, deeply persuaded that as a result, uh, you'll get foreign direct investment to, to a local economy, but also have a success story. Just a week ago, I believe, a first Georgian uh, startup was acquired in $50 million uh, by American company. And just the US Mac working half a year, I believe, in this country. So, so I think that it's, it's something that they require some effort, but it will uh, repay itself in full. Absolutely. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. I would love, we love to engage in your region more. So I, I look forward to partnering with you all. Thank you. Please stay in touch. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Have a good night people from <laughs> other side and then for our people have a good day. <laughs> Bye Thank everyone. You. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.